Wave of peace just came in here when I was listening to that song. It's beautiful. Well, um, I had a difficult time trying to choose a subject for this uh, today, but the Lord led me to this baptism of the Holy Ghost. And um, I pray that it will be a blessing to you. According to what Jesus told his disciples, it was not their prerogative to know when the kingdom would be restored to Israel. But, it says in verse 8, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the utter most part of the, of the earth. He had something better for them to place their minds on than when the kingdom would be restored to Israel. And he told them what they would be doing with this gift. And the power that they received was given to them for the publication of the gospel of Jesus Christ, starting in Jerusalem, and preached until the kingdom was given back to God's people in the end of time. The disciples are not now here, so they can no longer preach, but their writings are still here to preach. And what Jesus told them is applicable to us today. We can continue to preach this gospel to the world as a witness. We are the remnant of the seed of the woman. The fact that we, as God's people, are still preaching the gospel enrages Satan. And we've read this before. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And this war was especially noticed and seen and experienced during the Dark Ages when the dragon used his agents to make war with the remnant of the seed, of the woman's seed. He did this until his agent received a deadly wound. But we're told in the Bible that this deadly wound would be healed. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose wound, deadly wound was healed. Well, I would say, and I think most of, you, of, of us here would agree that that wound is just about healed. Amen. And the second beast will, use, will be used to empower the worship of this first beast. We all know who this is referring to. If not, I'm not going to talk about that right now. But I just want to bring this up so that we can understand and know that the devil will persecute God's people when the uh, gospel is preached as a witness. Amen. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Amen. Well, that brings up a question, at least it did to me. I'm not suffering persecution. I don't think any of us are. So are we really preaching the gospel? Are we really living a godly life? We need to be serious about this. This is not just a question to Think about some time when you have free time. I don't like to talk about things uh, that is this serious and just kind of move on to the next point. This is something that we must look into, each one of us individually, and ask the question, what am I doing, Lord? Why am I not suffering persecution? Your word says it, and we know this is true. We have seen it. We may have experienced some of it. So this brings us back to, okay, there's something that's missing. There's something lit missing in my life. It's not knowledge. I can always learn more, but I don't think it's just knowledge. It's something else. And we need to learn what that is. We, re we re uh, read that the beast suffered a deadly wound 
But we also know that during this time that God's remnant people have not been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's like the persecution stopped and so God's church just kind of went silent yes, from the time that the wound was uh, inflicted upon the beast. Yes, We've been doing our own thing with little dependence on the Holy Ghost. This is what Jesus told us in response to our preaching during this time period. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 and we'll start at verse 15 and read to verse 20. Revelation chapter 3, 15 to 20. And it reads, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with good, and have need of nothing, that's fatal. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, that's fatal. I counsel thee, that's vitalizing, to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salves, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And I looked that word up, chasten, in the Greek, and it means to discipline by punishment. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. When we as God's people accept Jesus' rebuke, and his discipline, his chastisement, what will be the result of that? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The message to the Laodiceans is a call to repentance, righteousness, and preaching of the everlasting gospel and to warn the world about the worship of the beast and receiving of its mark. We cannot jump right over Revelation 3 and start going into Revelation 14 in our own personal lives. We must go through the process that Jesus tells us we need to change and then we can be ready to proclaim the three angels' messages. Amen. When an angel makes a declaration from heaven, it's generally the message for God's people to preach at that time or until the end of time. And we see this example in Luke chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger Verse 17 is what I want to highlight here. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child, this child. So when we hear an angel coming from heaven, I'm bringing this out so that people will say, well, that does, just because the angel says that doesn't mean we have to preach it. Yes, it is. It's something that we need to preach. If an angel is preaching it from heaven, that's code for us as God's people. Speak, open your mouth. While we don't visibly see the angels in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, we know that because of the prophecies in Daniel, the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 and other places, and the time that we live in, that it is time to preach the three angels' message, also known as the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to preach it with power. This was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet. 
the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek and hath sent me to, blind, to bind the brokenhearted, to pr proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now Jesus declared this very verse and uh, he was not looked well upon for doing so, but he omitted verse 2. That verse is now applicable for us to preach Amen. because we're talking about the mark of the beast and the everlasting gospel. So we need to do both, preach the gospel and warn. When we preach on the day of vengeance, which is actually going to be the seven last plagues, and we live godly lives and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will suffer persecution, which the people of God will have to endure patiently. Yes, sir. The, pe the preaching of the three angels' message of Revelation 14 will result in persecution from those within the church and those without. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, and then it continues on, we know what it says, what they're, what's going to happen to them. <clears throat> Those who are world-loving, Jesus-hating, will not want to hear this message, and they will let God's people know and know on certain terms. After that de declaration, a visible characteristic of God's people is seen and noted. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The fact that we will still have the patience, that we will have patience, reveals that we will go through trying times and disappointments. People who we thought were faithful and godly will turn on us. Family members will betray us and the world will hate us. And at some point, all of them are going to try to destroy us. That requires something which we do not now possess. If you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness which he imputes to the repentant sinner. What's the common denominator between Revelation 14, 12, and Revelation 12, 17? There's something in there that's common to both of these verses. Keep the commandments. The commandments of God Amen. and Jesus Christ. I want to look at something here that I've shared before, but I find it very interesting and want to share it again. And this is found in uh, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto, unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And in the, in the concordance, the word witness, I'll share it one more time because I believe it's worth doing. This is what it means. It's a neuter of a presumed derivative of 31 or something evidential that is generally evidence given, or specifically the Decalogue. What is the Decalogue? Ten the Ten Commandments. In the sacred tabernacle, to be testified, testimony, witness. So this is telling us that as we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the faith of Jesus Christ, we will be preaching also the Ten Commandments because it's essential that people understand that if they don't keep the Ten Commandments, the opposite or the uh, alternative to that is receiving the mark of the beast. From all we've seen, we can conclude that the reason for the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for witnessing. Amen. It is given for the, for the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it is also given for the transformation of character so that when we do witness, we will have an experience with Christ to tell about. Amen. God's people should not be reporters of the gospel, but testifiers of the gospel. Amen. There is a difference. Amen. 
you can read something and tell, something about, tell someone about it, or you can experience it and then express that experience that you've had. This is where we need to be. This is what we must do. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. In our opening scripture, uh, Jesus said this, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. He spoke of two baptisms. What is the difference? Right, for you're baptized by water and you're baptized by the Holy Ghost. There, there's got to be a difference. He, he made it plain there. Let's take a look at some things here. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen. These believers had not heard of the Holy Ghost, never heard of him. They were baptized by the baptism of John the Baptist for the repentance of sins only. But Paul says that this baptism was given so that people should believe in Jesus and also gives them the capacity to believe in Jesus as their personal Savior. And when we do that, the result of believing in Jesus is the reception of the Holy Spirit, also the reception of righteousness which comes by faith. So the difference between the two baptisms is that one was for the repentance of sin, the other is an outward manifestation of a repentant heart that has accepted Jesus as a personal savior. This is when the baptism of the Holy Ghost takes place and a new life is revealed that mirrors the character of Jesus Christ and enables the Christian to be a witness who will suffer persecution. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Amen. This is a reference to righteousness by faith. Amen. At death, a transfer of sin and a reception of life, the raising up in that life and a living a new life in the power of the glory of God. Amen. What are the signs that tell us that we have the Holy Ghost? Peace. First is peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and a transformed character revealing the mind and heart of Christ. And all, all the fruit of the Spirit will be seen in the life. And that is, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If one of them is missing, then there is no Holy Ghost. This is not, the, the reception of the Holy Spirit is not a gross. It's a reception of a entity, the divine Spirit of God, which brings with it its character, which is the character of Christ, which will reveal itself by the, these fruits of the Spirit. So if we're missing one, we're missing all. Amen. We have to have all in order to know.
They all come with him. And the second sign is that we will have victory over the ruling power in our lives. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So we have a carnal nature that's fallen and sinful. If Christ is in us, he will subdue that as we cooperate with him. And we will not be living a life of sin. We will be living a life of victory. Amen. The third point, the gifts of the Spirit. Everyone in the body of Christ receives a gift to profit with. And this means to profit by adding to the kingdom of God. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is of the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given the Spirit of the word of wisdom, and another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of the spirits, discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. The first, fourth point, the Holy Ghost gives us talents for positions in God's church for the building up of the body. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen. The Holy Ghost is the most essential gift that we can receive from Christ. Amen. Understanding the work of the Holy Ghost is a safeguard against the false ideas that people have of the Holy Ghost. Feeling happy and being excited is not a sure sign of the Holy Ghost's presence in our lives. We will also glorify God when we have the Holy Ghost. Amen. To glorify God means to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Those two aspects of giving glory to God are summarized in the experience of righteousness by faith. Another question comes to mind how can we know what gift or position the Holy Ghost will give us? And there are many programs that have been brought out. You know, uh, you sit down, you write out certain things that you know, will kind of give you an idea of what your gifts might be. And, and those are, they're not bad, they're not helpful, but this is not the way to receive confirmation as to what gift God is going to give you. The way that you find out how to get, how, what God will give you is to become a partaker of the divine nature and actually receive the Holy Ghost. He will tell you. Amen. He will make it evident in your life and in your heart. This is what you need to do. Something will be pressing upon you because every one of us has something that we consider needs to be done or straightened out or people need to understand. This becomes our duty. And we're told in the spirit of prophecy, the voice of duty is the voice of God. Amen. So as we see our duty, we can see it more clearly with the presence of the Holy Ghost than we can without. We will be of much more certain that this is what we need to do. Amen. People can also tell us, they can refer to us, uh, things that they see in us, characteristics that we would be good for doing. That's fine too, but the bottom line is we need to understand from the Holy Ghost himself what we need to do. And then we will not have doubt, we will have certainty, and we will be convicted and no one will deter us from changing from that. Amen. The only way to know what this gift or position is, is to first receive the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will not give 
a person anything that is not a part, that he is not a part of, excuse me. So if you don't have the Holy Ghost, don't expect a gift. The gift comes with him, not apart from him. But after we are partakers of the divine nature, then he will make this known to us. There is only one way to receive the Holy Ghost. It hasn't changed since the day it was given in the days of the apostles, and it is this. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as, our, as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. The Holy Ghost is the one who ad administers grace to us. He is the one who opens the scriptures to us. And by doing so, he reveals Christ to us. Amen. He empowers us and gives us wisdom and strength and he is the representative of Jesus Christ. It is his work to make us righteous as we cooperate with Christ. So if we sin, he is the one who convicts us through our consciences. He is the one who opens the law to us that we can see our sinfulness. He is the one who gives us repentance. He is the one who brings us to Christ for pardon. He is the one who gives us power to resist temptations when we choose to do so. He is the one who teaches us and leads us into all truth. He is the one who will be the reason that the wicked will persecute us. He is the one whom, if we reject, will result in our eternal damnation. Our cooperation with the Holy Ghost is vital. We must look at our lives and see where we stand and examine ourselves. And the question comes back, why am I not receiving persecution? Stern words. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I believe it's time to search our hearts and allow the Holy Ghost to bring us back home. What do you say? Amen. To bring us to a place where we are compassionate with our family members and those even who annoy us. To bring us to a place where we are wise and can proclaim the truth with wisdom and compassion. Not in a way that will turn people away, but in a way that will lead them to Christ so he can do work in them through the Holy Ghost. We must allow the Holy Ghost to bring us to a place where our hearts will be pure and our words and action will reflect that. Lord, help us. Amen. Lord, help us. Worldliness and selfishness, we don't need. We need the life of Christ so we can be faithful and true and be soul winners with the Lord. Then Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your sincerity with us in letting us know our true position and not allowing us to walk in deception. Lord, help us to examine ourselves today, not to put this off and to make the changes with your grace that we need to make. We ask that we, you would use us so that we can continue the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. We ask that you would work in our hearts in such a way that when we recognize our deficiencies, our faults, our shortcomings, and our sins, that we would have a, a, a desire to come to you instead of a desire to hide and make excuses. Please bless us now in the remainder of this Sabbath day. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen.